Okay, come closer to the podium. We're almost ready for Eibert Dreisma. I asked him what he was going to do on stage, and he actually said, you know what, I don't know yet. I'm just going to take my stuff on stage and make magic happen. So I would like a, uh, a moment of zen. <laughs> a moment of zen, please. Um, and um, while we're at it, I will tell a little bit more about uh, Eibert's accomplishments. He's been hired for his creative work by Heineken, Shell, Invention, Alping. He teaches, he's worked for uh, do-it-yourself uh, stores, and he's been a full-time working artist since 1992. Um, I'm wondering if I was even born at that time. Yeah, I was. I was still. I was. I was around already. Give a please. Give a uh, very warm applause for Albert Dreisma. Do it. Same face. Okay. Nice to see you all. Like um, I don't. I forgot her name. Just told. Actually, I don't know mo in most cases what I'm going to talk about, but I think I was su supposed to do a talk about the history of technology. So maybe it's interesting to start with one of my um, favorite projects that actually mm, some kind of old school technology. And um, well, basically this is where it all came from. It's, uh, it's called a singing bird cage, which actually is a kind of strange name because it's not the cage that is singing, but it's the bird that's in the cage. Just a second. So you wind it up. I'll keep it close to the microphone. And then if you switch it on. But according to me, actually, this is one of the first. Y you could even call it a robot because basically it's. Um, uh, yeah, a clock-based, a clock-like mechanism, and uh, it always has the same setup. It always is a little bird in the cage, and the technology would be in the base of the cage. But uh, you could see it as a robot because it performs a very specific task that was uh, invented by somebody beforehand. And uh, this one is from 1963, but. In the beginning of 1800, there was a switch wa a watchmaker that was already building birds like this that could whistle a song that would last for 20 minutes. So you, you would wind it up, and the bird would whistle or sing a song for 20 minutes before it would repeat itself, which is actually quite amazing, I think, in the beginning of 1800s. And um, I, brought, I brought an old mechanism I hope it's, it can be, can be seen on the screen. This is actually what is inside a little birdcage. And uh, I bought it on eBay and later I found out it, it happened to be a very expensive mechanism because this mechanism, I could easily sell it for a thousand euros or more, but the seller didn't know what it was. So I was, I was very lucky. So let me switch it on. Can you see it? And basically what it, what it does, there's a, the li there's a little uh, bellows to, cr to create air pressure and a little whistle, a whistle that uh, operates like a slide whistle. So the longer the whistle, the lower the tone. And then there's a quite advanced mechanism to uh, control the, the movement of the whistle as well as the air stream. And all of this has to be done very precisely in order to make the the bird really sing in a beautiful way. So basically, there's air pressure, there's a control mechanism to, to, to move the slide whistle, and there are tiny little valves to, uh, to create air pressure exactly at the right time. And this is quite important, otherwise it would sound like <coughs> And the me mechanism takes care of 
everything. So in order to open the valves at the right time, first put the, the slide whistle in the right position to make it sound more like <coughs> So that's the way it should be done, very precisely. And then later on, this was replaced by editions like this. This is from the 80s, and it's basically the same. It's a little bellows, a very little whistle. Later on, maybe you can have a closer look at it. And um, two little wheels with notches. And, and uh, yeah, one wheel controls the bellows, and another wheel controls the slide whistle. And if you switch it on, It would whistle a song, but obvi obviously it will only last for o uh, only a few seconds, so it's a very short song, and um, which is a pity. And then even later, this again was replaced by electronic. So then yeah, we ended up with stuff like this. Can you hear it? But I think it's it's kind of boring because because of all the electronic use and the fact that it doesn't really do anything, it's more like yeah, it's dead. It lost all poetry. And uh, yeah, well even one bird later, these little birds came on the market. Still not very interesting. Basically what I'm doing right now, I'm, uh, I'm working on the next generation of singing bird cage. So the thing I'm trying to cr create is um, a little bird in a cage with the technology in the base, but then the technology must be top-notch modern technology because I want this bird to be able to whistle any song. So using Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, uh, Spotify, whatever, you should be able to send your favorite song to the bird, and then the bird should whistle it. And this actually is more complicated than it sounds, because there's a lot of software to create uh, karaoke songs. So you put in an MP3, and then the software would take out uh, uh, the vocals and keep the rest. So if you play it again, the song would sound, but without the vocals, so you can sing along. But in this case, I would need the opposite, because when I would ask you to whistle your favorite song, in most cases, you would whistle the vocals and not the, the bass guitar or the drums. So I'm trying to develop software to do this that would isolate the vocals uh, and throw away the rest. And uh, yeah, I think it will take me now maybe three or four years, but the interesting thing of where we are now is that basically we can do anything we want. Anything we can dream of, we can actually create, and we can even create it in such a way that it will last forever. And um, well, there's an I have a let another example of a project like that, something I've been working on for some time. Oh. This is also a smaller but funny project. It's a battery eater, and it's also something that I was able to create using help from, from other people on, uh, on online platforms. And it's a tiny little robot. You can insert an empty battery and then it will blink for at least half a year, but in many cases it will blink its eyes for one and a half year or even longer until the battery is really empty. And then you might, you might think this is quite something, but actually it's not because after this little robot, I developed new electronics, and now I can have two LEDs blink for 85 years using one AA size battery. And this is also something that's very interesting for the time we're living in. We can do amazing things that are extremely durable, and they, they, they will overlive us. And yeah, just using internet and help from, help from online communities even as an individual, you can do something that only 10 years ago would have been impossible. So that, yeah, that's 
pretty cool, I think. And uh, I promised also to to tell, to show some projects. Um, I guess it up. Well, whatever. This is another project. Uh, it's one of my favorites. It's from some some years ago already. Um, I can't even remember how long ago it was, but at some point I was asked by Auping, which is a Dutch uh, manufacturer of uh, of bed, to um, create something related to mobile sleeping. And then, first of all, I started thinking about maybe the refugee problem because. Uh, yeah, obviously, when you're a refugee, you, you're traveling continuously, and you might want to take the stuff you own along. You're sleeping at different places all the time. But pretty soon, I found out that it's really difficult to come up with something that's really useful for refugees within a limited time of only two months, because I only had two months. So then. I had a problem because I want, wanted to do something that was really interesting. And well, be, being a designer, when you have a problem you cannot solve in many cases, it's a good idea to ask yourself, okay, if it was my problem, what, yeah, what kind of solutions would I look for myself? Well, then you should know I'm one day a week, I'm a teacher at the Design Academy in Eindhoven, and then to arrive at the academy in time, I have to wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning, and then I'll, I would be te teaching until 4 o'clock in most cases. After that, I would have, a, I would have talks with uh, graduating students, and in many cases, I'd be uh, traveling home around 10 o'clock or even later, so I, I, yeah, in many cases, I'd be tired. So then I would be sitting in the train, reading a book, and then it would be something like, I would fall asleep and then wake up again because of the, f uh, because of the, yeah, I don't know the English word. In, in Dutch it's called uh, knikkebollen. So I would fall asleep and then wake up because of my head going forward. So I thought, no, this is something that's really closely related to mobile sleeping for, for me as a person. So I thought that's something I'm going to to solve. And actually I thought the solution is really simple because you, you could just take a rubber band that would go over your forehead, over, over your back and then, yeah, um, dat onder je oortot uitkomt, hè? A rubber band, so it would support your head when you fall asleep. Well, the best thing to do is make a mock-up model, so that's what I did. This is what I made. And you can see it's very practical and easy to use. So I used bicycle uh, inner tires to do this. And well, it took me like 10 minutes to make it and it works perfectly well. I c could easily fall asleep like this. And the interesting thing is, you would think that you would need the, the central bicycle tube to stabilize your head in this, this direction, but actually it's not like that. You, you need the, the central uh, bicycle tube to stabilize your head sideways. Because if this one wasn't there, the rubber band could do like this. And then you would ob obviously fall asleep against the person sitting next to you because your head is quite heavy, so you would fall to one side. So actually you need this one to stabilize your head in this direction. Well, which is just funny, I think. <laughs> but obviously, no one would be sitting in the train wearing this. So I thought, well, let's take it as a, a real design project and design different nightcaps for different target groups. So that's what I did. First of all, I had an old lady knit one for me. So this is what she made. And you could imagine that using different uh, uh, yeah, materials, colors. It could be related to boys or to girls, but the good thing is you can see it can be a very simple model, and yet it could be functional. 
I only forgot one thing, if you use it like this, it doesn't work because a knitted uh, uh, fabric is, is too flexible. But yet I kept it like this because I thought, well, you could imagine if it's, if it's lined with a different material, it, it won't be flexible anymore. So it's not, I didn't think it was necessary to, to change it. As a model, I, I, I like it. But next to that, I thought maybe make a different model using neoprene. This is neoprene. This is the, the kind of materials huh, they use to make surf gear. And also, it's, it's very practical because it can add some privacy to, to the product. So right now I can fall asleep and people around me can actually not see if I'm sleeping or not. But it has a problem. The area that's visible to me is too small. And that, that makes you feel unsafe. Uh, now, one of the companies I worked for was uh, Praxis. And one of the things, the products I designed for them was, uh, um, I don't know the... English word again. Oh. A cutterbuck, what is that in the Engels? A cat litter box, maybe? Well, for Praxis, I, I designed a cat litter, litter box. And a good lit, uh, cat litter box is not too close because when the cat is on the toilet, it needs to be able to see its surroundings because it's in a very vulnerable position. So it's really important that the, the cat can have yeah, see the world around it. Otherwise, you, you feel unsafe like with this nightcap. So I thought, OK, I must add some uh, privacy, some safety, but not too much. So I made a new one. That's actually this one. Yeah, I th it's much better. And designing this, I, I took a look at products like horse riding caps, uh, police helmets. Oh. And you can see, actually, it's, it's still a very simple looking uh, product. But yeah, it adds just enough um, privacy. And still, I, c I can be s uh, reading or sleeping, and nobody around me could tell what I'm doing. So. I think it's qui a, a quite good one, but okay. I thought maybe I could do, I can do another one for. Oh yeah, uh, this is one. This is also an interesting one. I made one using felt because felt is not flexible at all and it's a very comfortable material. I use different closures. Hmm. I reg regret that, but okay. This, yeah. It's a comfortable one, but okay, it's a maybe a little bit too open. But when I looked at the model, I thought maybe I could emphasize the fact that it in some ways relates to the old fashioned nightcap, the one with a little uh, sphere on top. So well, I made yet another one. That's this one. Because the way it's built up is actually like the way you would build up a, a, a globe when you want to flatten it so it would be built up from parts so that's how I made it and yeah I like the fact that now it slightly refers to the traditional light cap but yeah and then I thought me maybe maybe I could also design one for like um, survival, uh, people that like survival in the woods. You could think it's for the army, but I don't like the army at all, although they might sleep a lot over there. But yeah, this one has a problem, I think. Although function-wise, it's a really good one because it, it gives you a lot of uh, privacy and uh, still I can see enough around me. But later on looking at it, 
it made me think of the 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 the, the cap the, the 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 slaughter guy in the Middle Ages was using. So yeah, in the end I didn't really like it bec because to me it looks too aggressive. Although function-wise, it's it's an interesting prototype. And then I thought maybe. What have you now done? Is it erg? I let it go away. But uh, so later on I thought I could also make one for. Um, a really classy woman, a, a fashion-like lady. And the, the in interesting aspect of this nightcap is that if, if I don't shave for two days, it might be like a lumberjack nightcap. But then again, when it's worn by a lady, they, they might, as Dina before will, they might do, so do something like this and then wear it in a very ladylike manner. And actually, I was on the, the International Furniture Fair in Milano uh, yeah, organizing the the Alping booth, um, yeah, installing my nightcaps, and there were a lot of Italian women that didn't even know what the, these the nightcaps were meant for, but yet they start they started trying them on, looking in the mirror, and I thought, well, okay, so in some cases it might not be that important what the the product was really meant for, and. Um, that like when I was young in the in the eighties, there were a lot of women wearing uh, leg warmers, and I don't think they were actually wearing these leg warmers to warm their legs. But it was a new fashion item, so a new item they could use to differentiate themselves from others, and that was actually the main reason these items sell so uh, sold so good. And I think this was, uh, and this this might. So maybe this was a bit similar to the what was going on with the nightcaps. And then later on, something else happened. I was on a television program with um, Jack, uh, Jack Spijkerman. And then after the television program, I was uh, uh, contacted by three different organi organizations representing people with muscle problems, muscle diseases like ALS, MS, people that couldn't use the neck muscles anymore because of a, a car accident or something like that. And they asked me, well, this is interesting. Could, could you maybe develop a nightcap for us that would keep our head yeah, in an um, upright position? So, we, so in that way we would end up with a, a medical, um, maybe a Yeah, a, me a medical problem a product that would look like a fashion item. And this was something I tot totally didn't think of. And then later on, um, I was filmed by um, a, a Japanese television program. And then months later, I received an, uh, a postcard from a guy in Japan and he said, well, interesting, I saw your nightcaps on TV, really cool, you should, you should come to Japan or maybe Korea or China, you, you would sell a lot because actually in, in China, Japan, Korea, the chairs in the, in the subway are, uh, yeah, you're sitting with your back to the window. And uh, this guy said, well, this is a cool item, but we already ha uh, found our own solution uh, for the snickerballer because there was a Japanese guy that uh, designed a, a, a product that was basically a hairband with a big su suction cap on the at the back of it, so you, so you could just uh, pop your head against the window and then you would be fixed, and w which is basically another solution for the same problem. And then there was even a little sign on your fore forehead saying, um, wake me up at the Utrecht Central Station. But yeah, this is also interesting that in many cases, along the way, there will be spin-offs from your ba basic idea that you never even thought of. And that's, yeah, for me, that's interesting. And then, okay, there's one more project I'd like to show you. I have to take a look at my time schedule. Oh, I'm on schedule. Um, this, again, is some something totally different, but it's very much related to what we can do using um, modern technology, using uh, 
online communities, working together with people all over the world to, yeah, sharing ideas to make, make something happen. Well, I was, I was asked by a Dutch television uh, uh, program, Clockhouse, to help a little boy with, uh, yeah, to develop his uh, idea. And this guy had, had a, a grandfather suffering from a Parkinson's disease. So this the grandfather would be shaking a lot and uh, as a result of this, th this he, he couldn't eat soup. And this guy, he, he, visited, he visited the zoo and he noticed that a chicken moves in a very interesting way. When you pick up a chicken and you move the chicken, the, the head will remain in the same position. So yeah, when you go online and you Google for a chicken, uh, you'll find a lot of interesting movies where they pick up a chicken and do this, and then the, the, the head will remain in the same position. And this is because a chicken can only focus when its head is not moving. So basically when a chicken is walking, it would focus, then walk its body, under body underneath uh, its head, then move its head forward, walk its body underneath its head again. S uh, yeah, and uh, so in that way a chicken keeps it, uh, its head uh, yeah, in the same non-moving position as long as possible. So this guy, this little boy, he, he came up with the idea and he asked me, could you develop a spoon based upon the mechanism of a chicken. Pretty cool idea. So I googled chicken spoon, and then I found an advertisement saying, what could be the relationship between a spoon and a chicken? So the spoon already existed. There was even a commercial showing a, a chicken and a spoon, well, whatever, and later on Mercedes made a really cool um, commercial based upon the, the same uh, principles, you should really Google it. Just Google uh, chicken Mercedes, you'll find it. So, well, I, I told the guy, you, you really came up with a good idea because it's already on the market. So that's the perfect proof, it's a good idea. So let's reverse engineer it. Let's take a look at which steps might have been necessary to come from the chicken to the spoon as it is I in the shop right now. So that's what we did. So I made some prototypes to show to the, the guy. And then when you develop something like a anti-Parkinson disease spoon, yeah, the best thing to do is yeah, start looking at existing principles. One of them is The cardenic suspension. This is something you could use to stabilize a spoon. It's a very basic principle. Basically, yeah, it's uh, yeah, several rings with a weight, and it's a, a mechanism. In most cases, for instance, it's used to keep um, a compass horizontal in a boat. So the boat could move like this, or the boat could move like that, and. That, yeah, the, the compass will remain more or less in the same position, but the disadvantage is that you, you would always need a weight. So if you would translate this to a spoon, you might end up with something like this. This is a spoon with a cardenic suspension, so I can move my hand like this, and I can move my hand like that. But then again, you, you'll still need the weight, so y you can't reach your plate. So this is not going to work. So we skipped it. Then something else you could look at is, uh, as I made it myself, but I am. So this is something, it's known as the Steadicam principle. You might know it. I actually, I think everybody knows it. The Steadicam principle was developed to take out the moving, uh, yeah, the, 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 the movement of the cameraman because when you're walking, it's always going a bit, little bit like this. So you would need a mechanism to damper this, to take it out from what you're filming. And this is a very 
sim simplified uh, model to show what it does. And basically, the, the, a good working steady cam mechanism, it, it, it dampers this movement, it dampers it in this direction, and it also dampers the movement in this direction. So this is something we, we could actually use. So ma maybe keep it in mind. But then we're living in 2016, so the best thing to do is use a computer, use technology. So that was the next step. So I tried to build a model that would do what I wanted and I would integrate, yeah, basically most of these uh, principles. Oh, I forgot one. Another principle that's very, very uh, useful is the gyroscope. You should really try it later on, but th this is a simplified version of a, a, a gyroscope. I can move it really easily like this, but once you spin it, then I can even rest it on my finger and it will more or less, it now it's really hard to, to, to change its position. A gyroscope is very useful to stabilize stuff. So I thought, well, maybe we could also use a, a gyroscope to develop this spoon. So, okay, the next step would be to use these different principles and integrate them in one model. And uh, to build it, I used Arduino because it's very practical. Uh, and sometimes it pro has problems in areas like this because the, the power supply is very... Uh, it's not very constant, so I'm not sure if it will <laughs> work perfectly, but well, I think it will wor work good enough to demonstrate what I'm trying to show you. Come on, even still stay, young Basically, this, this, this is a, a mock-up model again. This is, yeah, one of the, the axes of the cardenic suspension and then yeah this this servo motor would be the other one and then to um, simulate the muscles and the brain I use the Arduino Nano uh, Uno which is a little computer then here are actually a couple of sensors I connected to the Arduino actually this is the position sensor so it will know in what position the spoon is but it also has an integrated gyroscope and it has um, yeah, a snellingsmeter um, a sensor that can measure the speed yeah the speed yeah acceleration sensor so using these sensors connected to the, the Arduino Uno with the two servos I can simulate the spoon I'm trying to develop. So if I connect it now, and no, it has some problems with the power supply, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, okay, uh, I'll, I'll switch it, I'll, I'll change it once more and then I hope that it will work a little bit. I think it will work a little bit. The interesting thing is, if I move it now, the spoon tries to keep its position. And actually, this, is, this took me only like, not even a day to develop. And even if I move it like this, you see, it tries to keep in the same position. And it may look complicated, but actually I copied everything. I, I asked myself, okay, where can I find the right software? Then I thought, okay, these drones, these drones, they fly, and then they must have a technique to keep the camera in the right position. So that's where, where I started looking, and I just copied the software they use to keep the camera horizontal under a drone. So basically, this is drone technology. But it works pretty good. And, yeah. This is also interesting that basically any problem, software related or not, 
you can find similar solutions online and just use them, modify them a bit, and you, you would end up with uh, something that's working pretty good. So then, uh, let's kijk again. Ah, yeah. Um, I didn't even bring the final spoon as it is on the market because it's so boring. Because it works so good, you, you can't see what's happening. So I thought I might as well not bring it, so I didn't. Because actually these models are so much more interesting. Um, I think for three years. And the spoon is called the liftware spoon. It's, it's $320, but it's not available in Europe. So, and this is the actually the next step. You could see it as the last step before the final spoon as it is on the market. And it's something, again, I bought it, I modified it to make it do what I wanted it to do. It's, again, from the camera world, it's basically a hand handheld gimbal for a GoPro camera. I connect into chicken head, and, and I use these red things to make it more clear what, what's going on. So this is a device that was developed to keep um, a camera in the right position when, you, for instance, you would be uh, on the back of a motorcycle or doing something or uh, whatever. So I can switch it on, and then it would, <laughs> it would think for a second, and then... Uh, know what position to take. So this is basically more, yeah, this, is, this, is, this could be a spoon already because I could do this and I could do this and the, the chicken keeps looking in the same direction and it works really good. But it has a problem because if this is the spoon and I want to bring it to my mouth, <laughs> it won't do so because the chicken tries to keep its position whatever I do. So that's a problem. But then again, it's software based. So I can modify the software and tell it, okay, you should move and uh, you, sh you should copy my movements and just make them smooth. So if I tell him to do so, like now, now it's, it's, it's copying what I'm doing, but just in a smooth way. And that's exactly what we're looking for. So basically this would be the last step before the spoon uh, as it is on the market right now. And then I, if I switch it off, it would, it would like, uh, I really like it. So that's it. I find it so grappig dan, eh? But, okay. But yeah, these are very interesting, interesting things you can do using technology. I'll show you just one more thing. Another funny. Uh, I will always alles opruimen. I'm actually a very structured person. Everything in my, in my studio has a very specific spot where it should always be. So I can always find anything I might need whenever with my eyes closed. So this is there for promotion and even op. Jullie wachten toch wel. Zo. En zo. Ik kan hier. Zij zit hier. Ja. Oké. Okay. Just one more smart item. This is also a really nice item. I developed, I developed it in 2011. Right now there are similar items on the market, but I think none of them is as smart as this one. Still. It might also suffer from the power fluctuations, but let's just see if it works. If not, then 
there's nothing we can do. Yeah, it's going to work. Okay, this is a, 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 a secret knock box. Actually, there are more secret knock box uh, online right now, a lot of them, but this is, I think, the smartest. And I developed it to, to tell children a little bit about the, the, the process of developing a product and how you can use technology to do whatever you want. And, uh, well, basically, it's a safe. Because when you're a child, you would always have a secret. And if you have a secret, you want to keep it a secret. So the best thing to do with your secret is put it in a box and lock it. But if it would be uh, a, a lock with an ordinary key, you might lose the key. And then you cannot reach your own secret anymore. So that's a problem. Or, and that's even worse, maybe when you're at school, someone else, even your, your parents might find the key, so they would be able to look at your secret without you even knowing it. Because obviously they would put back the key at the same place. So then somebody else would know your secret, but you wouldn't know that somebody else knows your secret. So that's, that's really scary. So okay, being an inventor, uh, I came up with a solution for these children and I developed this, uh, this smart box. And it's, um, yeah, I, I already kept off the club. It's a secret knock box. So children can assemble this box themselves and then record their own secret code. And only when you knock the right secret code, the box will open up. So let me give a demonstration. Here are two LEDs for feedback. There's a green and there's a red one. If I knock it, it will blink green first, indicating I hear a knock. But, uh, but then it would blink red, saying it's not the right code. So, well, if you want to open the box, you should know th the right secret code. And if you would ask any child what would be a good secret code, they would come up with something like, die gehen wir nooit meer terug. So that could be a code to use, but oh, it's not working, eh? I have to see it myself. Yeah, I made a mistake. I don't know what went wrong, but only if you knock the right code, the box opens up. And then in order to make sure you won't forget to close it again, it automatically closes. So let me do it again. And, well, in case you need a little bit more time, you can detach it from the magnet, but the, the, then still the software knows it has to close, so the, the handle goes back to, the, to, yeah, in order to lock the mechanism. So you can see it here. Does it seem so? Yeah. Eh? If the handle goes down, it knocks, it puts the lock into lock position, so now it's locked over here, but the lid is still open. So that's why I added a little rubber band over here. So this handle can still move. So I can close it and it will be locked again. And also, there are several things you won't see or realize immediately. For instance, the lock is low. It's, it's below the level of the, this uh, surface, so you could never use a credit card to open it because it's too low. And also, when when locked like this, this handle is not attached to the lid. Oh. It's only yeah in touch with the lock itself, but it's not connected to the lid. So you you could never open the box by shaking it. So when you, when you knock the right code, first of all, it unlocks the mechanism, and then the, the handle reaches the lid. And then, because the servo motor has a different pivot point than the lid, 
the handle, it starts here. You see? It starts here. And it moves like this. It moves into this direction because it has a different pivot. So, and because it's not connected to the lid, at some point, the, the, the lid would slip backwards and then you can't close it anymore. So that's where I need the little magnet for. So it starts pushing against the lid like this. Uh. More, 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 more. And before it reaches the vertical position, it, it catches the lid. So then it can move on holding the lid to make sure it can actually close it again. And because this is a digital servo, as long as there's a, a, a pa the power is connected, it will always know its exact position. So it knows it should rotate exactly 140 degrees. Um, okay. What do you Yeah, but you can, you can just slightly touch it. That will be enough already. Okay, but yeah, just one more thing about the digital servo. Because it's a di digital servo, it always knows its position as soon as there's power. So right now, if I reconnect the power, it will first check its position, see that it's now a little bit less than 90 degrees, and then close as soon as possible, as quickly as possible, because it also knows it's a safe, so it should never be open. So if I reconnect the power, so it thinks and then closes quickly. And then just one more thing, because I think my time is finished. Uh, when I, I just finished it, uh, it, it opens immediately because it's a super fast computer like all computers. So you knock the code, it, it knows if it's right or wrong, it opens. But actually, that's boring. So I thought I should add just a little pause, a little a moment that nothing is happening to make you be in doubt, thinking, did or didn't I knock the right code? And this is interesting because just adding half a second, it's only half a second, it makes you think, ooh, was it right or wrong? So you can do a lot to, to change the psychological aspects of an item using yeah, just adding half a second. And this is something that's interesting to, to play with software, doing tiny little things like that. So, yeah, yeah it's almost un invisible. Look at it. So. You see, it's just half a second, but it completely changes the way you, yeah. It, it changes. But I th they keep waving at me, so I think I have to stop. So I'm that was it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Albert Reisma. Are there any questions for Albert? Any questions? Did you learn something today? Do you feel like you can go home with fresh and new ideas and go and build stuff of your own? I see some, I see some modest nods there. They're like, yeah, yeah, we can do this. We can handle this. <laughs> <laughs>